Hello and welcome to Bread Theory. I'm your host, Zach, and tonight we're going to be continuing on with our audiobook reading of Alexander Berkman's What is Communist Anarchism, which has also gone by other titles such as the ABC of Anarchism. Uh, and it's basically just an introductory text to the principles and ideas behind being an anarchist and, and not just the the way that the, the media would, would uh, have you believe that anarchism is about just chaos and no rules and, and a very, you know, 12-year-old sort of <laughs> conception about what, uh, what anarchism is. Uh, instead, it's about no hierarchies and archism. Uh, it's about everyone having relatively the same amount of political power and power to control their own lives. Um, and we've been uh, working our way through. We're up to, to chapter eight tonight. This is a long one, um, so I'm going to get to it pretty quickly here. Uh, and this is on justice, which is definitely an important topic. If you're thinking about a system where everyone is, is basically on equal footing, uh, you definitely want to know what happens if someone tries to get power over others. If someone tries to hoard resources or political power or whatever it is uh, in order to gain leverage over others. So definitely an important topic to uh, think about. Uh, I don't think I have any announcements or anything now that the lefties awards are, are passed. Uh, just kind of sitting back, enjoying the end of, of the year here. Uh, not having as much to do. It looks like I'm a little out of focus. Let me try and fix that one second. I think that's a little better. Uh, so yeah, let me go ahead and queue up the video for tonight. And as always, we are using Audible Anarchist. Oh, they're a really great resource. They've done so many leftist, uh, well, mostly anarchists, as you can imagine, audiobooks that have just been read by members, volunteers, this audio. Oh, there we go. Let's pause that for the, the time being. But yeah, Aud Audible uh, Anarchy. Really great resource. And as always, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask. There, there are no dumb questions uh, unless you're asking in bad faith. That's really the only time that uh, I'm not going to appreciate it. I'm gonna restart that oh here we go cool all right let's get into the text tonight i'm gonna take that off of there and i'm gonna take away the captions i haven't updated my podcast in a while because i've, I've moved over to podbean for a variety of reasons. Uh, one of them is eventually I'd like to be doing uh, a live podcast at the same time as I'm doing these these live streaming sessions. Um, but I, I just haven't gotten into that part yet. I've been working on other stuff, getting through my backlog of videos from before I did uh, the multi-streaming, stuff like that. And of course, the, the Lefties Awards took up a lot of my time for a while. But eventually I'll get back to the podcast and start updating it again. Um, and, but anyway, if you, if you're interested in checking out some of my back episodes, I, I certainly have quite a few, I think I'm up to like 40 or 50, uh, in the podcast feed there. So, so plenty to go through, but there's the link for that. I should create a command for that as well. I will eventually for, for each one of my social medias, but haven't gotten around to that either. So a lot of work to be done on the channel. Uh, stay tuned to that for that but anyway let's get into the the chapter on justice here we go production was made in collaboration with audible anarchist chapter eight justice Ooh, put on the no, closed caption as terrible as it is to admit it there is no justice in the world worse yet there can be no justice <clears throat> as long as we live under conditions which enable one person to take advantage of another's need. I would agree with that. It's kind of hard for there to be justice if some people have more justice, right? 
it's 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 like that that line from uh, uh, Animal Farm, which you know take it take it for what it is, but uh, it's the idea that that some people are in their case animals, or, or uh, everyone is equal, but some are more equal than others. Okay, and that's kind of the system we live under now. We have supposedly equality before the law. But obviously, that means different things depending on your socioeconomic status. Uh, if you have a lot more money, you can bring the best legal minds in the world to bear uh, to help get you out of whatever you've gotten into. And at the very least, you can be sure that if you get convicted of whatever it is, that it's because you really did it. <laughs> there, there's not really any chance that, you know, you're not going to get off. Uh, Unless, you know, you really have, have done something bad. Uh, so, yeah. So, if people are all unequal, it's very hard to have equal justice. And that's not to say anything inherently unequal about them, but the way that they are able to express their, their power in the world, uh, their social standing, all that sort of thing. If not everyone's on an equal footing, it's hard to have equal justice. To turn it to his profit exploit his fellow man. There can be no justice as long as one man is ruled by another, as long as one has the authority and power to compel another what against his will. There can be no justice between master and servant, nor equality. Justice and equality can only exist among equals. Is the poor street cleaner the equal of Morgan? Is the washerwoman the equal of Lady Astor? Let the washerwoman and Lady Astor enter any place, private or public. Will they receive equal welcome and treatment? Their very apparel will determine their respective reception. Mm -hmm. Because even their clothes indicate, under present conditions, the difference in social position, their station in life, their in influence, and wealth. Mm -hmm. The washerwoman may have toiled hard all her life long may have been a most industrious and useful member of the community. The lady may have never done a stroke of work, never been of the least use to society. <clears throat> For all that, it is the rich lady who will be welcome, who will be preferred. I have chosen this homely yep. example. And, and this, this cuts across not only class, but of, of course race, especially in the United States. They've done a number of studies and they found that uh, the, if you have a, a black man and a white man, each of them have the same prior convictions, are being uh, charged with the same exact crime around the same circumstances. The black man is, is more often than not going to be convicted. And that's regardless of the makeup of the jury. There could be black people on the jury. Um, they're still more likely to convict. So this whole notion that we have a, a blind justice system, that it treats everyone equal before the law, uh, well, maybe in a high-sounding principle, it definitely does not come out that way. Because uh, people bring their own prejudices along with them. People uh, who are taking part in the justice system are, are fallible. They, they have prejudices. They, they have um, preconceived notions of, of various types of people. And they don't set that aside. We're not, I mean, we're not robots, for one thing, but just in general, the, uh, the, the societal ideas about different groups are carried into the courtroom, too. It is typical of the entire character of, of our society, of our whole civilization. It is money and the influence and authority which money commands that alone count in the world. Not justice, but possession. Mm -hmm. Broaden this example to cover your own life, and you will find that justice and equality are only cheap talk. Lies which are taught while money and power are the real thing, realities. Yet there is a deep-seated sense of justice in mankind, and your better nature always resents it when you see injustice done to anyone. You feel outraged, and you become indignant over it, because we all have an instinctive sympathy with our fellow man. For by nature and habit, we are social beings. I mean, and this... I'd say it's a very true statement. We all have a pretty innate sense of justice. Uh, and, and you can even see that 
when it when it comes to things like employment um you know the <clears throat> your average worker uh wants to be paid well they they see that things are instead set up to give them as as little as possible uh and and try to work them harder and harder they feel unfairly treated they feel a sense of injustice and uh consequently they they resent the uh owner class and the owner class sees them as inherently um you know trying to get something for nothing you know get uh get money for for doing a job or not working at all um that's definitely the way that that unemployed people are seen as uh you know being a free rider on the system and again it's the it's people's sense of justice that comes into play that's not to say that they're right about that in fact in most cases they're they're wrong to assume that that people who are unemployed or underemployed just aren't trying hard enough or you know and have something inherently flawed about them it's just that the system is set up to benefit those who already have um, but still i think it is a true statement that everyone has a pretty innate sense of justice that doesn't uh, that also doesn't mean that that our sense of justice always lines up with one another you know uh, there's plenty of things that i'm sure one person could feel is is completely justified and another would feel is totally beyond the pale but when your interests or safety are involved you act differently you even feel differently suppose you you see your brother do wrong to a stranger you will call his attention to it you will chide him for it when you see your boss do an injustice to some fellow worker you also resent it and you feel like protesting but you will probably refrain from expressing your sentiments because you might lose your job or get in bad with your boss. Your interests suppress your better urge of nature. Your dependence upon the boss and his economic power over you influence your behavior. <laughs> Suppose you see John beat and kick Bill when the latter is on the ground. Both may be strangers to you, but if you are not afraid of John, You'll tell him to stop kicking the fellow who is down. But when you see a po the policeman do the same thing to some citizen, you will think twice before interfering because he me might beat you up too and arrest you to boot. He has the authority. John, who has no authority and who knows that someone might interfere when he was acting unjustly, will, as a rule, be careful what he is about. The policeman who is vested with some authority, and who knows there is little chance of anyone interfer interfering with him, will be more likely to act unjustly. Mm -hmm. Even in this simple instance, you can... Isn't that interesting that there's basically the same conception of the police that that uh, those of us on the left have today? Uh, this book was written in, in the 20s, uh, I believe, uh, or maybe was it the early 30s? It was like uh, 29, I think. 1929 so it's almost 100 years old now and yet he got right to the heart of it right there police are given this this huge amount of leeway because they're vested with authority um so that <laughs> there's a big moral hazard there because that means that whatever they do people will you know skew towards believing their side of things trusting them <coughs> more and just legally there's a lot less you can do to them um, so yeah, interesting that <laughs> fighting those same battles even back then. Observe the effect of authority, its effect on the one who possesses it, and on those over whom it is exercised. Authority tends to make its possessor unjust and arbitrary. It also tends to make those sub subject to it acquiesce in wrong, subservient, and servile. Authority corrupts its holder and debases its victims. Mm. If this is true of the simplest relations of existence, how much more so in the larger field of our industrial, political, and social life? We have seen how economic dependence upon your boss will affect your actions. Similarly, it will influence others who are dependent upon him and his goodwill. Their interests will thus control their actions, even if they are not clearly aware of it. And the boss? 
will he not also be influenced by his interests? Will not his sympathies and his attitudes and behavior be the result of his particular interests? The fact is, everyone is controlled in the main by his interests. And that's, you know, exactly what Marx was getting at uh, when, when he talked about the, the inherent conflict between the different classes. As long as you have a privileged class and a less privileged class, there's going to be inherent conflict, and it's all going to be based on personal interests. The lower class has a personal interest in getting more power, of course. They, they and, and usually rightly so, they are held down um, through arbitrary circumstances that are, are largely beyond their control. Uh, they just happen not to win the lottery of birth or, you know, ever be in the position to exploit others to get ahead. And on the flip side of it, uh, the, the owner class has a huge class interest in keeping as much for themselves and slamming the door behind them as soon as they get any sort of privilege. Uh, and, and you'll see that they uh, build up their whole belief system around that. They, they come up with ideas about how they deserve more and how everyone else is lazy and how, you know, it's through their own hard work that they got ahead and if everyone just did what they did, well, they could all get ahead too. Which ignores a whole lot of stuff, like the fact that without the workers, they would never have gotten wealthy. Uh, and in, the, in under the capital system, in order to get wealthy, you basically have to exploit other people. You have to have workers to exploit. So even if you had a program where every worker could become an owner, at some point, someone's got to work for somebody else. Right? So the whole system just that, that whole notion that everyone can get ahead by being an owner falls apart pretty quickly especially when you look at the ratio it has to be a lot more people uh there has to be many workers to have one owner even in the in the smallest operations um you know just like a little mom and pop shop they're, they're gonna have usually more employees than than owners uh, by a fair bit and so again, we can't all be in that position. Uh, yeah, getting back to the, the, the idea of everyone uh, is controlled by their interests um, this is absolutely true. It's absolutely true. There's, there's inherent class conflict because of these, these competing interests. So the only way really to get beyond that is to do away with, with systems that allow for exploiter and exploitee are exploited, uh, it, it does not strike my notion of justice at all that it's okay to take the labor of others and use the, the profits generated from it for yourself. I mean, most people would agree with that, that it's not okay to <clears throat> sit back and let other people work for you, right? It's just that if you're someone who likes capitalism, you don't somehow see that your employees are working for you and that's the only reason you have this excess money. Uh, and they, and, they, and it's, it's so strange too because they come up with all these euphemisms like have your money work for you. Well, your money is real people for the most part. It's, it's your employees who are at work generating money for you even if you're kicking back at home. Um, they say, you know, like, uh, well, anyway, well, let's get back to the text, actually. We'll, we'll keep moving on, because this is a big chapter. There's a 50-minute chapter here, so I do want to maintain a pretty good pace. Our feelings, our thoughts, our actions, our whole life is shaped consciously and unconsciously by our interests. I am speaking of the ordinary human nature of the average man. Here and there, you will find cases seem to be exceptions. A great idea, or an ideal for example, may take hold of a person that he will entirely devote himself to it and will sometimes even sacrifice his life for it. In such an instance, it might look as if the man sac acted against his interests. But that is a mistake. It only seems so, for in reality, the idea or ideal which the man lived or gave his life was his chief interest. <laughs> The only difference is that the idealist finds his main interest 
and living for the some idea, while the strongest interest of the average man is to get on in the world and live comfortably and peacefully, but both are controlled by their dominant interests. The interests of men differ, but we are all alike, in that each of us feels, thinks, and acts according to his particular interests, his conception of them. Now then, can you expect your boss to feel and act against his interests? Can you expect the capitalist to be guided by the interests of his employees? Can you expect the mine owner to run his business in the interests of the miners? We have seen that the interests of the employer and the employee are different, so different that they are opposed to each other. Right. Can there be justice between them? Justice means that each gets his due. Can the worker get his due or have justice in a capitalist society? Hmm. If he did... So now this is interesting. I, I'm not. I'm not. Definitely not a, a uh, Proudhon scholar. Proudhon being basically the father, father of uh, the modern anarchist movement. Um, but he believed in something. He believed in a system where we could keep owner and worker as long as every worker got the full product of their labor. So once you've taken out expenses for the company. Um, insurance, you know, uh, every, everything that goes into maintaining the company, you divvy up all of the, the profits based on, num I guess, number of hours worked per person, and that would include the owner as well, so the owner has to work as well. They can't just be a, in, an owner. But as long as every person gets out what they put in, then he thought it would be okay. Now, how you would do a system like that, that's less clear. That's less clear because you're, you're, you're trusting then the owner to uh, not squirrel money away, for one thing, uh, put it in, in accounts that are you know marked as rainy day fund or something like that, and then use it for themselves. Um, and you get into the idea that you have to, you know, calculate well you know i i did so many hours and and this is the the profits that's directly generated from my work and that's not always clear especially if you're doing very complex operations you know with, with many different parts of assembly perhaps uh, many different types of labor going into it it's not clear at the end you know like who, who deserves what, right? And, and Kropotkin, Peter Kropotkin, another big anarchist thinker who we have covered, uh, basically thought that too. It's like, it's just, things are so complex. Like, like um, if you use coal for your operation, does the person who mined the coal get part of the profit? Uh, do they get, uh, does the, the engineer who designed the coal shaft get part of the profit too? Like, uh, there's so many parts that it becomes too complex to break it down. So instead, what you could do is at least have a, a worker-owned cooperative. And that was the, the topic of our last video on Sunday. And we looked at what worker-owned cooperatives entail. And in that sort of a scenario, everyone is both worker and owner. So nobody can sit by and collect profit without working. And no one has more power than another. And in that sort of a scenario, you can negotiate among yourselves who gets what part of the profit. And you may decide that if a manager has more responsibility or, you know, has a more stressful job or if some job entails more schooling or technical knowledge that, that's not as easy to come by, you may end up saying, well, they deserve a larger share of the profit. But that's at least something that you have a say in. Because in a worker-owned cooperative, every member gets one vote towards things like how the profit is divvied up, um, and as, as well as things like scheduling and stuff like that. And, you know, all the, all the, the big important functions um, or areas that, that your enterprise is involved with, um, that's all made collectively. It's, and, and to be clear, it's not as though like every decision, like, you know, we're all going to decide which supplier we have for, uh, let's say we're a, we're a cafe. 
we're not all going to decide where the the coffee comes from and where the milk comes from. We're not going to decide that, you know, we're going to go negotiate for a cheaper price on on napkins or something like that. We we leave these sorts of of, of daily responsibilities uh, to the managers because there still would be managers. Um, so if you're the 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 buyer. For the, the, the company, that's that's your job. If you're the accountant, that's your job. Those aren't all collectively decided. It's it's the big things. The things like, you know, does anybody get health care, health benefits? And if so, what are they going to be? Um, what are the requirements for new members in terms of uh, perhaps putting in uh, their own share? There's there's the, the form of cooperative that, that was mentioned in the video where everyone puts in a few thousand dollars. Um, and, and I would assume that would be over time. So like it gets taken out of your paycheck until you've put in your 5,000, 10,000, whatever dollars. It's a different way of, of capital formation. Um, so, you, so you decide stuff like that. You would decide uh, other benefits. You would decide scheduling, uh, workplace conditions, um, how things, how conflicts would be disputed. But again, you would delegate the actual conflict dispute resolvement to probably an HR person or something like that. So, uh, yeah, anyway, gotten a little bit sidetracked. So let's get back on track with Capitalism the chapter. Capitalism could not exist because then your employer could not make any profits out of your work. If the worker got his due, that is, things that he produces or their equivalent, where would the profits of the capitalist come from? Right. If labor owned the wealth it produces, there would be no capitalism. It means that the worker cannot get what he produces, cannot get what is due to him, and therefore cannot get justice under wage slavery. If that is the case, you remark, you can appeal to the law, to the courts. What are the courts? What purpose do they serve? They exist to uphold the law. If someone has stolen your overcoat and you can prove it, the courts would decide in your favor. If the accused is rich or has a clever lawyer, the chances are that the verdict will be to the effect that the whole thing was a misunderstanding right. or that it was an act of aberration and then the man will most likely go free. But if you accuse your employer of robbing you of the greater part of your labor, of exploiting you for his personal benefit and profit, can you get your due in courts? The judge will dismiss the case because it is not against the law for your boss to make profits out of your work. There is no law to forbid it. You will get no justice that way. It is said that justice is blind. Yeah, he's getting into that as well. So yeah, so it's, it's going to take a reframing of what sort of systems we allow. Um, and just a, more so a reframing of... of how we look at our current system. Number one, do we agree that, that capitalism is inherently exploitative to the, the worker? That in order for a boss to make a, or let's not use the word boss, let's just say owner, for an owner to make a profit, they need to take some of the, the revenue generated by the efforts of the worker for themselves. So without doing the worker's work, they get the workers, they get the, the product of the workers' labor. So if we agree to that, then we say, okay, is this inherently ex, you know, an exploitive, uh, exploitative um, system? Is, is that an exploitative, an exploitative thing to do, to take someone's, uh, take the product of someone's work for yourself? just because you're a boss or not a boss an owner and if we agree to those two things then we have to ask the question why do we allow that system to exist is it just because we've never thought about it uh is there something we're somehow missing in this equation you'll you'll get a lot of capitalists trying to defend it by saying well the the owner took the risk so they deserve the reward but even if that's true, let, let's let's pretend that's true for just provisionally for a second here. It's not. But let's pretend that's true, that the owner takes the risk so they deserve a bigger reward. At what 
point then have they been justly compensated for taking that risk? Is it once the business becomes profitable? Is it once they've made a certain percentage in profit back above and beyond what they, what, whatever loan or whatever they took out? And at that point, what, whatever point we decide is fair, then what? Then does the, the business get to reorganize as a worker-owned cooperative? Is there more, at least more profit sharing involved at that point? Because you can't really just ride on one risk forever, can you? Could it be like an intergenerational thing? Um, I think last time I used the example of like McDonald's, which is a many decades old company. Just because Mr. McDonald uh, took out a loan from a bank, likely, to, to start the first hamburger place, uh, does that mean that whoever owns it now should keep reaping the reward from his risk? Which probably, I, I'm fairly certain that the original owner of McDonald's is probably long since passed. Um, but somebody owns it, and someone is still reaping huge profits from it. They didn't take out the reward. They probably, they may not even have been born when McDonald's started. Uh, I don't even know. That, in fact, you know, that'd be a little interesting thing to look up. We'll take a little side journey here. Let's look at McDonald's as a company. Let's just find the Wikipedia for it. Okay, it was founded in 1940 by Richard and Maurice McDonald. Okay. Yep, yep, yep. Let's see who owns it now. Who owns McDonald's? There we go. It's like Google was listening to me. That's scary. Oh, and then it typed in who owns Burger King. <laughs> Way to go, Google. Who owns McDonald's now? So, the president and CEO is Chris Kempsiznik. Or Kempches, maybe. Um, it's one of those difficult names. Probably Polish. Kempsinski. Kemshinsky? We'll say that. Let's take a look at this guy. He doesn't look like he was born before 1940. Let's look up his stuff. All right. Let's see. Oh, let's... Not what I wanted. I thought that was the Wikipedia. Here we go. So he wasn't even born. The current owner and CEO was born in 1967. Also says slash 1968. That's kind of weird. <laughs> I don't know why it says that. Anyway, a couple decades after, nearly three decades after, McDonald's was formed. And now he owns the company. He is still reaping that reward even though he wasn't even born when that original risk was taken. How does that make sense as an argument then that if you, if you take the risk, you should get the reward. I, do, I don't even agree with the premise, but, but even if you did at some point that has to run out, it has to be a really thin excuse to keep exploiting people and keeping on profiting from their labor. Um, but let's go back to that that original premise then if you take the risk you should get the reward well is it really that much of a risk to start a business i mean it takes a lot of work don't get me wrong it takes a lot of intellectual labor to organize the the correct legal documents to you know figure out all the logistics for everything to find a location to buy it to hire people to get the whole thing rolling that takes a tremendous amount of effort um and you could maybe argue that all that effort deserves compensation, but again, at some point, as an owner, that effort's going to lessen itself, 
otherwise, why would you, if you, I mean, if you had to keep scrambling as hard as opening that very first McDonald's, let's say, why would you keep doing it? I, I don't think that you would. Um, at some point, you're going to sit back and start just raking in the dough from, from other people's efforts, your employees' efforts. Uh, so, but still, so is, is that really even a risk either? Is that a risk to take out a loan? I mean, let's consider what happens if, if the business, if McDonald's had gone under instead, what would happen to that original founder? Would he have to sell off all his possessions? Would people be able to sue him personally for losses if he couldn't pay all his creditors? No, as long as he's at least organizing as a, a LLC, a limited licensing corporation, his personal assets would be safe. So his personal car, his house, his personal bank accounts, assuming he's at least a good businessman and keeps separate books, all that stuff would be untouchable. He could declare bankruptcy and basically dust his hands off and, and, and walk away from it. There's no legal ramifications as long as he was, you know, not doing anything wrong. It's not like he's, you know, as long as he wasn't embezzling money or something like that or, you know, literally stealing all of his, his employees' profits, uh, not paying them at all or something like that. If he's just not a great businessman and the business folds, not a lot of consequences. He doesn't really even have to pay back that loan. That's, I mean, that's less, that's literally less risk than a, an 18 year old taking out loans for college takes. Because let me tell you, those loans don't go away. You can declare bankruptcy and those loans don't go away. Um, in, in certain circumstances, you could die and those loans go to the other people that co-signed on them as well. And they can't get rid of them through bankruptcy either. Student loans are a much bigger risk than a business loan. Uh, that's just the literal truth of it. Um, so it's a really flimsy argument to say that I take the risk, I, I need the reward, just to begin with. Um, I guess that was, the, that was the main point. Let's get back to the book. But that is meant that it recognizes no distinction of station, of influence, of race, creed, or color. This proposition needs only to be stated to be seen as thoroughly false. For justice is administered by human beings, by judges and juries. I was talking about it. Is, is justice blind? That was the question. Interest, not to speak of his particular personal sentiments opinions, likes, dislikes, and prejudices, from which he can't get away by merely putting a judge's, by putting on a judge's gown and sitting on the bench. The judge's attitude to things, like everyone else's, will be determined consciously and unconsciously by his education and bringing up, by the environment in which he lives, by his feelings and opinions, and particularly by his interests and the interests of the social group to which he belongs. Considering the above, you must realize the alleged impartiality of the courts of justice is in truth a psychological impossibility. There is no such thing and cannot be. At best, the judge can be relatively impartial in cases in which neither sentiment, his sentiments nor his interests as an individual or member of a certain social group are in any way concerned. In such cases, you might get justice. But these are usually of small importance, and they play a very insignificant role in the general administration of justice. Let us take an example. Suppose two businessmen are disputing over the possession of a certain piece of property, the matter involving no political or social considerations of any kind. In such a case, the judge, having no personal feeling or interest in the matter, may decide the case on its merits. Even then, his attitude will, to a considerable extent, depend on his state of health, his digestion, on the mood in which he left home, on a probable quarrel with his spouse, and other seemingly unimportant and irrelevant, yet very decisive human factors. Or suppose that two working men are in litigation over the ownership of a chicken coop. 
the judge may in such a case decide justly, since a verdict in favor of one or the other of the litigants in no way affects his position, feelings, or interests of the judge. But suppose a case is before him is that of a working man in litigation with his landlord or with his employer. In such circumstances, the entire character and personality of the judge will affect his decision. Mm -hmm. Haven't we seen not that lately? The matter will necessarily be unjust. That is not the point I'm trying to make. What I want to call to your attention is that, in the given case, the attitude of the judge cannot and will not be impartial. His sentiments towards working men, his personal opinion of landlords or employers, his social views will influence his judgment, sometimes even unconsciously to himself. His verdict may or may not be just. In any case, it will not be based exclusively on the evidence. It will be affected by his personal subjective feelings and by his views regarding labor and capital. His attitude will generally be that of his circle of friends and acquaintances, of his social group, and his opinions in the matter will correspond with the interests of that group. He may even himself be a landlord or have stock in a corporation which employs labor. Consciously or unconsciously, his view of the evidence given at the trial will be colored by his own feelings and prejudices, and his verdict will be a result of that. Besides the appearance of the two litigants, their manner of speech and behavior, and per particularly their respective ability to employ a clever counsel, will have a considerable influence on the impressions of the judge and consequently his decision. It is therefore clear that in such cases, the verdict will depend more on the mentality and class consciousness of the particular judge than the merits of the case. This experience is so general that the popular voice has expressed it in the sentiment that the poor man can't get justice against the rich. There may be expectations now and then, but generally it is true and can't be otherwise as long as society is divided into different classes with differing interests. So as Bergman sees it, as long as we, as he was just trying to, to say there, as long as we have these social divisions that, that put one class above another, there's no such thing as, as complete justice. Things will always be colored and marred by the prejudices of whoever is, is trying the case, whether, whether that's by a jury or by a judge. So <clears throat> it, it, it seems like what he's driving at is that in order to have justice, we have to get rid of these, these class distinctions. Now, I don't think that quite goes far enough because I think even if we get rid of class distinctions, there's still going to be prejudice. Uh, there, there's still going to be different attitudes about people that do different lines of work, for sure. So even if, say, we all have you know, our basic needs met and everyone is free to, to work whatever job they uh, feel they want to do and every job is required to enfranchise all employees as also owners. Even in that scenario, there's still going to be people that are going to have, say, a low opinion of uh, exotic dancers. There's going to be people that have a low opinion of people that are not the same race as them. I don't think that just totally does away with all these other distinctions and prejudices. It definitely is, is a big one. It will definitely go a long way towards erasing uh, imbalances in, in the justice system, but I don't think it's the final word. I, I, I kind of, it doesn't seem like he's going to get to that sort of a, an understanding, but I, I think it's just important to bring up that that's also something that we need to think about as, as we're trying to conceive of a, a better world. So in a world where everyone is, is, is more or less on an equal footing, how do we navigate a justice system where there's still is prejudice within society. I mean, definitely we can, we can look at trying to uh, eradicate all these different prejudices um, and, and 
I think almost certainly doing away with the class disparity is going to do away with a large chunk of these different animuses towards one another. Um, I mean, at the same time, though, think about it. Think about uh, the, the, the group of white people that are parodied the most. You can probably even think of an accent that, that comes with it, at least in the United States. We'll, we'll stick to the United States right now. Who, who's the group of white people? Who are parodied the most? Uh, is is it is it the you know the upper class New Yorker? Is it the 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 genteel Southern gentleman? Uh, or is it the 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 people that that have all sorts of labels put on them, such as hick or redneck or yokel? The 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 supposed uneducated, unwashed, lower class of Southern men, uh, men especially, but, but uh, just Southern people in general. That can't be because of class, can it? That, that's not a, a prejudice that has arisen because of class distinctions. It, it's not as though everyone that makes fun of them is in a better socioeconomic bracket, you know? Uh, I, I'm sure that, that poor Northerners still make fun of poor Southerners. Um, so there has to be more at work than that, which just kind of goes to show that, that getting rid of class distinction doesn't entirely do away with prejudice. Um, all right, let's, let's move on. So long as that is the case, justice must be one sided class justice. That is injustice in favor of one class against another. You can see it more clearly illustrated in cases involving definite class issues, cases of the class struggle. Take, for instance, a strike of workers against a corporation or a rich employer. On which side will you find the judges, the courts? Whose interests will the law and government protect? The workers are striking for better conditions of living. They have wives and children at home for whom they are trying to get a little bigger share of the wealth they are creating. Does law and government help them with this worthy aim? What actually happens? Every branch of government comes to the aid of capital against, as against labor. The courts will issue an injunction against the strikers. They will forbid picketing or make it ineffectual by not permi permitting the strikers to persuade outsiders not to take the bread out of their mouths. The police will beat up and arrest the pickets. The judge will impose fines upon them and railroad them into jail. The whole machinery of the government will be at the service of the capitalists to break the strike, to smash the union if possible, and to reduce the workers to submission. Sometimes the governor of the... And just to re-emphasize, as, as was brought up so often in state and revolution, that is because we have a capitalist state. We have a form of, of governance that, that privileges property, uh, property and those that own it, the property owning class. So no matter what we do, as long as we're still operating within that system, it's still going to skew things in favor of property and its owners. So we can go a long way to, to progress, but we can never quite get to any form of, of true socialism or, or anarchism or communism until we do away with the state itself, or at least this form of the state. The state will even call out the militia. The president will order out the regular troops, all in support of capitalist labor. Meanwhile, the trust or corporation where the strike is taking place will order their employees to vacate the company houses, will throw them and their families out of the <laughs> Company court, houses. Will fill their places. You know, a few years ago, I would not have, I would have thought that was an outdated notion, the idea of having company towns. Perhaps maybe uh, you don't know, you yourself may have not heard of what a company town is. Uh, it was once very popular, especially during the... the worst uh, excesses of the robber baron age where you would have a company that became so powerful and and basically monopolized 
their particular trade from from one end to the other um, to the point where they would build entire towns to house their workers. You know, say it often happened with things like a coal mine. So a coal mine, the best spot for a coal mine might not be, you know, near major intersections of, of transportation or, you know, might not be by a coastal area. It's just, it's just going to form where it naturally forms geologically. And so you might have to, to actually have a large coal operation. You might have to put up an entire town uh, around that. So oftentimes these companies, if they were large enough, would build the houses. There would be a company store. Um, you may have heard that that song, you know, I, I owe my soul to the company store. And that was from the, the time where you'd have these, these company towns where, you know, to be a worker, you would get housing. And and then uh, I don't know if it got to the point where you wouldn't even be paid wages. You'd be paid in like company store credit. But I, I think that's definitely a possibility. I, I'm not I'm a little bit shaky on that part of it. But but definitely the company store would be the only store in town. And surprise, surprise, they would jack up their price on everything so that most of your money, if not all, went back into that store. And then, of course, if you if you uh, wanted to get better working conditions or organized or anything like that, you're stirring up trouble for the boss, right? Uh, they would threaten to throw you out of your own home because they own the homes too. Uh, and <laughs> so, so the point was, you know, just a, a few years ago, I would have thought that was one of those, those ideas that was thankfully left in the dustbin of history. But now people like Bezos and, and, I think even Elon Musk were, have been talking recently about trying to revive that idea in order to work on their big projects. And of course, Bezos wants to put the entire working class out into space to mine resources for him while the rich get to enjoy uh, a pristine earth, which has been you know, freed of all the, the dirty pores and uh, all the polluting industries that, that support them. He wants to put all of that out into space. So it would basically be a company space station. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's not a great timeline that we're on. I got to say that. In the mill, mine, or factory with strike breakers under protection and with the aid of police, the courts, and government, all of which are supported by your labor and taxes. Can you speak of justice under such circumstances? Can you be so naive as to believe that justice is possible in the struggle of the poor against the rich, of labor against capital? Can't you see that it is a bitter fight, a, a struggle of opposed interests, a war of two classes? Can you expect justice in war? Truly the capitalistic class knows that it is war and even uses its every means at its command to defeat labor. But the workers unfortunately do not see the situation clearly as their masters, and so they foolishly twaddle about justice, Yikes. equality before the law, and liberty. It is useful to the capitalist class that the workers should believe in such fairy tales. It guarantees the continuation of the rule of the masters, Therefore, they use every effort to keep up this belief. The capitalistic press, the politician, the public speaker, never miss an opportunity to impress upon you that law means justice, that all are equal before the law, and that what everyone enjoys liberty and has the same opportunity in life as the next fellow. The whole machinery of law and order, of capitalism and government, our entire civilization is based upon this gigantic lie, and the constant propaganda of it by school, church, and press is for the sole purpose of keeping conditions as they are, of, of sustaining and protecting the sacred, in sacred institutions of your wage, wage slavery and keeping you obedient to law and authority. By every method, they seek to instill this lie of justice, liberty, and equality in the masses. For full well, they know that their whole power and mastery rest upon this faith. Isn't that the truth today as well? Every conservative 
squawks endlessly about, oh, I believe in liberty, oh, I believe in freedom, you know, I believe in, you know, living in a free country, a free country, free country, free country. It, 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 it's so ingrained into us that those concepts, they really don't mean anything. And that's the thing about so many of these myths uh, that, that, that hold up uh, capitalism, at least in the minds of people as the, you know, the, the logical system. Of course, of course, why not? Why wouldn't we do capitalism? So many of these myths that, that go towards propping that up, you push on them just a little bit and they just completely deflate. There's just nothing to them really of substance. So if you were to ask your average conservative, what does freedom mean? Well, it means freedom to, to do what I want. Uh, you know, um, drive wherever I feel like, buy whatever I want, you know, shoot my gun. They'll give you a, a, maybe perhaps a list of things, like activities that they can, they're allowed to do. Um, but when it comes to like their average daily life, the average person has very little freedom. Uh, they don't really make any of the choices about the way that they, the company that they work for runs. They don't make any choices about their own compensation for working for that company. They, they don't even have the choice to, to not work. You know, they, they have to keep working in order to survive, uh, work or starve. That's, that's the, the freedom that the U S stands for the freedom to choose your master, or maybe if you're really lucky to become a master, when it gets down to it, those are the freedoms that, that we have really. Oh yeah, we have the freedom to vote. Sure. We have the freedom to, again, select our masters, but it's more than often, more often than not people from privileged classes, because in order to be a politician, it takes money and it takes time off of whatever your normal job is in order to campaign, uh, in order to fundraise. That's, those are things that are just not open to most people. So is it really all that, that free? Do we really have even all that much political freedom? If, you know, and, and people are, Americans so often decry the, the low voter turnout and, and they say things like, well, if you don't, if you don't vote, you don't have the right to complain because, you know, you had a choice and, and you chose not to exercise it. I take a different view. I take the view that a lot of people, maybe even the average person, if they have time to vote, it, it takes a lot of, I mean, for one thing, it takes a lot of information gathering, which they maybe don't have time for. Um, and, and if you're a person at the, at the bottom, you're likely working more than one job because minimum wage does not cover living expenses anywhere in the country. So you're spending all your time working. What time then do you have to become politically informed enough to vote? What time do you even have to physically go and vote? And if you did, but you didn't even have enough time to, you know, read a paragraph about each of the candidates, what, I mean, what political freedom do you really have at that point? Uh, if you could never be a politician yourself, how much political freedom do you have? So, so, I mean, I, I guess I don't even, yeah, <laughs> keep getting off on these tangents tonight and then I forget where I've come from to begin with, but, um, yeah, let's, 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 uh, oh, we're talking about capitalist myths, that's why, because he's talking about, um, this, this faith in the system, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's. I think that's maybe one of the most powerful tools that, that the left could employ is just starting to poke holes. Push back a little bit. Plant that seed. Are you really free? 
Really? Where, where do you spend most of your, your waking hours during the week? At a job. It's likely what the person will answer. How much actual freedom do you have there? And if you go back and forth long enough, I, I would hope they would agree they don't have a lot of freedom. I hope they'll be able to see that. Then we can talk about political freedoms. Do you have a lot of political freedoms? Well, sure, you have the freedom to travel about the country. You can go state to state without showing your papers, unless you look like you may be illegal, in which case you'll get harassed even hundreds of miles from the, the U.S. border on a regular basis. You know, or if you just don't look like you belong here, which could be a euphemism for all kinds of things. But technically, you know, legally, there's nothing stopping you from traveling about the country as you please. Okay, so you got freedom to go anywhere in the country. How much bearing does that actually have on our lives and our ability to make choices within our lives? Um, I think if we just go one by one and start with freedom, because this is what anarchists want. This is what socialists and communists want. They want more freedom for the average individual, more freedom to control your destiny, more freedom to be able to decide what contributions you want to give to the world and then have the means to do it. Because like any, you know, again, anyone is free to become a doctor or a lawyer or a politician, but if you don't have the means to pursue that dream, then you're not really free to do it. That's just a, a physical reality for you, a physical barrier that's put up uh, between you and actually having real freedom. So what we want is real freedom. As leftists, that's, that's the whole game, more freedom for the average individual to choose how to live your own life. On every appropriate and inappropriate occasion, they feed you this lie. They have created special days to impress the lesson, lesson more emphatically upon you. Mm. Their spellbinders fill you with this, full of this stuff on the 4th of July. No. You are permitted to shoot your misery and dissatisfaction off in firecrackers <laughs> and forget uh. your wage slavery in the big noise and hullabaloo. Isn't that the truth? What an... I have to say, um, I've lived in a lot of places in the metro, in, in the, the Twin Cities metro here. I have never seen so many people shooting off fireworks as I did in my neighborhood this last 4th of July. And I think it's no coincidence that I happen to live in a, a neighborhood that is, is has some big uh, areas that are, are just not economically at the top. Let's we'll just say that there, there. Um, poorer people. And yet, we, when we drove through a street accidentally, and they had to move all their firecrackers out of the way, um, I felt bad for them. But every single house on that block had, had, had spent, it looked like, you know, hundreds of dollars, maybe hundreds of dollars on fireworks. As, it's funny that he brings up that, that, that notion of, you know, Pretend freedom. Oh, you have the freedom to, sh to shoot off fireworks on the 4th of July. Wow. Wow, that's, that's so meaningful. But I think that literally is true. They, you know, that's one of those things that if you ask your average person who's so about freedom, you put, you know, your average pickup truck driver who has the American eagle turning into the American flag emblazoned on his, his uh, back window there, if you ask him what freedom was, it, it'd be something like that. The freedom to, to shoot off fireworks. Again, how much how much bearing does that actually have on, on your life and your ability to control it? <laughs> Not really that much. Not really that much. Insult, the glorious I'm sorry, I keep, I keep uh, going off on these, these tangents too, but I got to keep more with it because we do have a large section to cover and we're already past 8 o'clock. I really got to be done in less than an hour so maybe less gab for me and, and more just uh playing through this this chapter here at that great event the american revolutionary war which abolished the tyranny of george the third and made the american colonies an independent republic 
Now the anniversary of that event is used to mask your servitude in a country where the workers have neither freedom nor independence. To add insult to injury, they have given you a thanksgiving day so that you may offer up your pious thanks to what you have not. So great is the assurance of your masters in your stupidity <clears throat> that they dare do such things. They feel safe having duped you so thoroughly and reduced your natural rebellious spirit to such an abject worship of law and order that you will never dream of opening your eyes and letting your heart cry out in outrage, pro outrage protest and defiance. At the least sign of your rebellion, the entire weight of the government of law and order comes down on your head, beginning with the policeman's club, the jail, the prison, and ending with the gallows or the electric chair. The whole system of capitalism and government is mobilized to crush every symptom of dissatisfaction and rebellion. I, even any attempt to improve your condition as a working man, because your masters well understand the situation and fully know the danger of your waking up to the actual facts of the case, to your real condition of a slave. They are aware of their interests, of the interests of their class, they are class conscious, while the workers remain muddled and befuddled. The industrial lords know that it's good for them to keep you unorganized and disorganized, or to break up your unions when they get strong and militant. By hook and crook, they oppose your every advance as a class conscious worker. Every movement for the improvement of labor's condition, they hate and fight tooth and nail. They'll spend millions on the kind of education and propaganda that serves the continuation of their rule rather than on improving your conditions as a worker. They will spare neither expense nor energy to stifle any thought or idea that may reduce their profits or threaten their mastery over you. It is for this reason that they try to crush every aspiration of labor for better conditions. Consider, for instance, the movement for an eight-hour day. It is comparatively recent history, and probably you remember <coughs> with what bitterness and determination that most employer employers opposed the labor effort. And isn't that uh, both? I mean, that that's definitely a sad thing that that even a hundred years ago, the eight-hour day was a recent thing. So before that, employers could just say work. 10 hours, 16 hours a day, uh, people would, would you know, I mean, in, in the really worst times of it, when there was the least regulation, people literally would come home, they'd sleep a few hours, and they'd go back to work. And they would make barely any money, barely enough to even scrape by. Um, and it was, it was labor, uh, primarily led by anarchist movements, that, that managed to finally push to get the eight-hour day. And now we're at a point in history where even that is way more than is necessary for most jobs. Most jobs, you know, peak in productivity after like four, maybe five hours, you know, at most six. Uh, so the rest of the time is just spent filling time until the... the, the clock strikes five or whatever, everyone can get out of the office. It's just arbitrary. I mean, the idea that no matter what you're doing, it's going to take eight hours to perform a, a good amount of it is just ridiculous. Uh, and it, it doesn't line up with reality. And yet we still have locked into it because it's just... I mean, it's part of the background at this point. People just assume you're going to work 40 hours a week at, at a, at a full-time position. Um, but we've done so much in the way of automation that that's, that that's really not necessary anymore. And yet it continues on. Um, and, and that's another one of those, those potential liberating forces having to work less and, and still be able to survive something that we could do today, something we could, uh, at least start moving towards. By, by promoting worker-owned cooperatives so that you would at least have a say in, in, in the 
hours that everyone works. And uh, and again, with worker one, one of the, one of the huge benefits of a worker owned cooperative is that if you're doing something and uh, a new piece of machinery comes out or, or something comes out that, that helps save you effort, um, maybe even as, 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 as simple as a, a, a way that you can do easy accounting, keep your books very quickly uh, and, and, and easily so that you don't have to, to have someone do that as their full-time job. Um, but whatever it is, if some, some new technology comes out, saves you labor. You can decide then, uh, as a collective, how to redistribute that surplus. Are we going to work the same number of hours and, and make more money? Or are we going to choose to reduce the number of hours that everyone works and make the same amount of money? Uh, instead of this, this cataclysmic thing that it is, you know, in most industries now, um, if, if automation comes in, that could be the, the end of jobs. And it's because the labor has now become superfluous to the owner. So as is always the case under capitalism, all the, the benefits of something new and better go to those that already own. But if everyone in the company owns, if everyone is also an, an owner in addition to being a worker, then everyone benefits. It's, it's, it's pretty simple that way. So, I mean, that alone it gives you even more freedom, or more of a chance for freedom. Uh, whether that's more money that you can use towards um, securing a better life for yourself and, and making the decisions you want to make, or whether that's more time to get politically involved um, in one way or another. In some industries in America and in most European countries, the struggle is still going on. In the United States, it began in 1886, and it was fought by the bosses with the greatest br brutality in order to drive the workers back to the factories under the old conditions. They resorted to lockouts, throwing thousands out of work, to violence by hired thugs and Pinkertons upon labor assemblies and their active members and to the de demolition of union headquarters and meeting places. Where was law and order? What side of the struggle was the government on? What did the courts and judges do? Where was justice? The local, state, and federal authorities used all the machinery and power at their command to aid the employers. They did not even shrink from murder. The most active and able leaders of the movement had to pay with their lives for the attempt of workers to reduce their hours of toil. Many books have been written on that struggle, so that it is unnecessary for me to go into details, but a brief summary of those events will refresh the reader's memory. The movement for the eight-hour workday started in Chicago on May 1st, 1886. May Day. Gradually spreading throughout the country. That's where May Day actually came from. The beginning was marked by strikes declared in most of the large industrial centers. <laughs> 25,000 workers. And it's it's a, a, a sad, ironic twist that uh, the U.S. is the only country in the world that does not celebrate Labor Day as, as May 1st. Uh, and instead, the government specifically went out of their way to create um, the the first well, the first Monday in September as as being Labor Day. Instead, to <laughs> it's just a big middle finger to the the anarchists that that work so hard to improve working conditions through the the Haymarket riot in Chicago. Laid down their tools in Chicago on the first day of the strike. And within two days, their number had was doubled. By the 4th of May, almost all uni unionized labor in the city was on strike. The armed fist of the law immediately hastened to the aid of the employers. Of course. The capitalist press raved against the strikers and called for the use of bullets against them. There followed immediately assaults by police upon the strikers' meetings. The most vicious attack took place at the McCormick Works 
where the conditions of employment were so unbearable that men were compelled to go on strike already in February. At this place, the police and Pinkertons deliberately shot a volley into the assembled workers, killing four and wounding a score of others. To protest the outrage, a meeting was called at Haymarket Square on the 4th of May, 1886. It was an orderly gathering, such as were daily taking place in Chicago at the time. The mayor of the city, Carter Harrison, was present. He listened to several speeches, then according to his own sworn testimo testimony later on in court, he returned to police headquarters to inform the chief of police that the meeting was all right. It was growing late, about 10 in the evening. Heavy clouds overcast in the sky. It looked like rain. The audience began to disperse till only about 200 were left. Suddenly a detachment of 100 policemen rushed upon the scene, commanded by police inspector Bonfield. They halted at the speaker's wagon from which Samuel Fielden was addressing, addressing the remnant of the audience. The inspector ordered the meeting to disperse. Fielden replied, this is a peaceful assembly. Without further warning, the police threw themselves upon the people, mercilessly clubbing and beating men and women. At that moment, something whizzed through the air. There was an explosion as of a bomb. Seven policemen were killed and about 60 wounded. It was never ascertained who threw the bomb. Even to this day, the identity <laughs> of the man has not been established. Even to this day. There had been so much brutality by the police and Pinkertons against the strikers that it was not surprising that someone should express their protest by such an act. Who was he? The industrial masters of Chicago were not interested in this detail. They were determined to, dis to crush rebellious labor to down the eight-hour movement, and to stifle the voice of the spokesmen of the workers. They openly declared their determination to teach the men a lesson. Among the most active and intelligent leaders of the labor movement at the time was Albert Parsons, a man of old American stock whose forebears had fought in the American Revolution. Associated with him in agitation for the shorter workday were August spies, Adolf Fisher, George Engel, and Louis Ling. The money interests of Chicago and the state of Illinois were determined to get them. Their object was to punish and terrorize labor by murdering the most devoted leaders. The trial of those men was the most hellish conspiracy of capitalist mm -hmm. labor in the history of America. Perjured evidence, bribed jurymen, and police revenge combined to bring about their doom. Parsons, Spies, Fisher, Engel, and Ling were condemned to death. Ling committed suicide in jail. Yep, and it, it was literally for their political beliefs. Uh, this, this this land of the free put, put to death these men for their political beliefs. They didn't have any evidence that they had been in any way linked to the bombing. They just knew that they were the leaders and they were terrified of a, a broader anarchist movement getting going. And so they they just killed them. The state just executed them. Freedom. Samuel Fielden and Michael Schwab were sentenced to prison for life, while Oscar Neeb received 15 years no greater travesty of justice was ever straight staged than the trial of these men known as the Chicago anarchists. What a legal outrage the verdict was. It'd be nice to, to dig more into that, that history at some point, because it's a very important uh, turning point in, in American labor. Uh, so I'll have to see what I can dig up in the way of audiobooks or videos or whatever to, to go over sometime. As you can judge from the action of John P. Altgeld, later governor of Illinois, who carefully reviewed the trial proceedings and declared that the executed and imprisoned men had been victims of a plot of the manufacturers, the courts, and the police. He could not undo the judi judicial murders, but most courageously he liberated the still imprisoned anarchists, <coughs> stating that he was merely making good. So far as it was <laughs> making common, good. a Jeez. terrible crime that had been committed against them. 
The vengeance of the exploiters went so far that they punished Outgeld for his brave stand by eliminating him from political life in America. The Haymarket tragedy, as the case is known, is a striking illustration of the kind of justice labor may expect from the masters. It is a demonstration of its class character and of the means to which capital and government will resort to crush the workers. Pressure. The history of the American labor movement is replete with such examples. It is not within the scope of this book to give a review of the great number of them. They are dealt with in numerous books and publications to which I refer the reader for a nearer acquaintance with the Golgotha of the American proletariat. Hmm. On a smaller nice scale, turn of phrase. Chicago judicial murders are repeated in every struggle of labor. It is sufficient to mention that the strikes of the miners in the state of Colorado, with, it, with its fiendish Ludlow chapter, where the state militia deliberately shot into the workers' tents, setting the ladder afire and causing the deaths of, of a number of men, women, and children, the murder of strikers in the hop fields of Wheatland, California in the summer of 1913, in Everett, Washington in 1916, in Tulsa, Oklahoma, in Virginia, and in Kansas, in the copper mines of Man Montana, and in numerous other places throughout the country. And make no mistake, just because we don't see this sort of violence anymore, or at least not definitely doesn't get any attention if it does happen uh that doesn't mean that they're st not still trying to mercilessly crush any sort of labor movement we definitely saw that with uh the underhanded tactics of amazon when they were working against the the uh, labor movement there in, in uh, bessemer alabama over the summer <laughs> they've become more subtle in their tactics though they, they would do things like, in, in that particular instance, they changed the timing of the traffic lights uh, in and out of the, the facility, the Amazon facility. So and they worked with the city of Bessemer to do this. And, and, and their aim was to make it so as people were leaving the, the I, I think it was a sorting facility, perhaps i don't know if it was a warehouse sorting facility what, what exactly it was the, anyway the 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 station as people were leaving at the end of the day they would be more likely to get a green light so that organizers who who couldn't organize on company property it's one of the rules if you you can organize as long as you don't do it during company time on company property so they would go to the other side you know to the the, the public right of way and, and try and stop cars as they were coming out of the parking lot. <clears throat> and they changed this and they, they worked out the, the stoplight system so that they would have less of a chance to do that. They worked with the Postal Service to install ballot collections for voting on the union on uh, a particular part of the Amazon property. Uh, I believe it was under, I believe it was under video surveillance. Uh, and this was an obvious intimidation tactic to to lower the amount of people that, that voted at all, uh, whether or not to unionize. They would do what's known as captive audience presentations, where they'd all call you into the meeting room and have someone talk about, uh, you know, a so-called expert come in and talk about the horrors of labor organizing and how they just take your money. And, you know, wouldn't you rather have a PlayStation 5 instead of having to pay union dues and all this stuff. And we're a family here. Uh, we, we don't need to have some third party come in and mediate stuff between us, right, guys? All these sorts of tactics that, I mean, that stuff, sadly, is still legal. You can <laughs> you can show your, your employees anti-union stuff. Uh, and and I, I don't even think they're allowed to say no about that. Um, yeah, and, and, and they'll find subtle ways of, of firing those that they, they feel to be leaders of, of any sort of organization effort. You know, they'll, they'll hold them to really strict standards like, you know, uh, the, they'll take out the employee handbook and, and it'll be like, you know, you have to have your safety goggles on when you're working 
uh, within 20 feet of, of such and such a machine or something something like that. And then they'll monitor them very closely for them to slip up so they can, you know, check, oh, you, you didn't wear your safety goggles. Or, you know, we, we noticed that you took an extra 20 seconds on your bathroom break. Um, you know, we're going to we're going to mark that down as as um, they'll come up with some reason, you know, failure to, to get back to work on time or, you know, time theft or something like that. Um, they'll be very strict and, and by the book when it comes to people that they want to get rid of because they're looking for a reason to break the movement. So again, it's not overt. Uh, but then then again, also, uh, labor movement in the United States is, is just a shadow of what it used to be. Uh, participation in unions is, is down below 10% at this point. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's really sad. To, to see the state of things. Thanks, thanks largely to policies like Reaganomics and just the neoliberal trudge to <laughs> destroy the country while fleecing the, the working class in the, in the process that's been going on since the, the 1980s, beginning of the 80s. So that's another reason you don't see these, these as much as just because there's not as much union organizing as there once was. But still, they, they've become wise to, to things. And, and now that there's more, you know, you can put things on social media, it would be bad PR to literally just go out and shoot people that are picketing uh, or have cops beat them up or that sort of thing. Because everyone at least has a camera now. So, so there's that too. But let's continue on. I don't know if we're going to make it through the whole chapter in the next half hour, but we're going to... Do our darndest. Nothing arouses the hatred and vengeance of the masters as the effort to enlighten their victims. This is as true today as it was in the time of slavery and serfdom. We have seen how the church persecuted and murdered her critics and fought every advance of science as a threat to her authority and influence. Similarly, has every despot also always sought to stifle the voice of protest and rebellion. In the same spirit, capital and government today furiously fall upon and tear to pieces everyone who declares to shake the foundations of their power and interests. Take two recent cases as instances in this never-changing attitude of authority and ownership. The Mooney Billings case and that of Sacco and Vanzetti. One took place in the East, the other in the West. The two separated by a decade and the whole width of the continent yet they were exactly alike, proving that there is neither east nor west nor any difference of time and place in the master's treatment of their slaves. Mooney and Billings are in prison in California for life. Why? If I were to answer in just a few words, I should say with perfect, perfect truth and completeness, because they were intelligent union men who tried to enlighten their fellow employees and improve their condition. It was just this, and no other reason that doomed them. The Chamber of Commerce of Sa San Francisco, the money power of California, could not tolerate the activities of two such energetic and militant men. Labor in San Francisco was becoming restive, strikes were taking place, and demands were being voiced by the toilers for a greater share of the wealth they were producing. The industrial magnates of the coast declared war on organized labor. They proclaimed the open shop and their determination to break the unions. That was the preliminary step in placing the workers in a position of helplessness and then reducing wages. Their hatred and persecution were directed first of all against the most active members of labor. Tom Mooney had organized the streetcar men of San Francisco, a crime for which the traction company could not forgive him. Mooney, together with Warren Billings and other workers, had also been active in a number of strikes. They were known and admired for their de devotion to the union cause. That was enough for the employers and the San Francisco Chamber of Commerce to try to get them out of the way. On several occasions they had been arrested, 
on framed up charges by agents of the traction and other corporations. But the cases against them were of such a flimsy nature that they had to be dismissed. The Chamber of Commerce bided its opportunity to get these two labor men, as their agents openly threatened to do. The opportunity came with the explosion during the preparedness parade in San Francisco, July 22, 1916. The labor unions of the city had decided not to participate in the parade because the latter was merely a show of strength by California capital as against unionized labor, which the Chamber of Commerce had set out to crush. The open shop was frankly procla proclaimed policy and it made no secret of its determined and bitter hostility to unions. It has never been ascertained who placed the infernal machine which exploded during the parade, but San Francisco police never made any serious effort to find out the responsible party or parties. Immediately following the tragic occurrence, Thomas Mooney and his wife Raina were arrested, as well as Warren Billings, Edward, Edward D. Nolan, member of the Machinist Union, and I. Weinberg of the Jitney Drivers Union. The trial of Billings and Mooney proved one of the worst scandals in the history of American courts. The state witnesses were self-confessed perjurers, bribed and threatened by the police into giving false testimony. Evidence showing the innocence of Mooney and Billings was ignored. Mooney was accused of having placed the infernal machine at the very time he was in the company of friends on the roof of a house about a mile and a half distant from the scene of the explosion. A photograph taken of the demonstration by a film company during the parade clearly shows Mooney on the roof and in the background a street clock indicating the time was 2.02 p.m., the explosion having taken place at 2.06 p.m. It would have been a physical impossibility for Mooney to have been at both places at almost the same time. But it was not a question of evidence or guilt or innocence. Tom Mooney was bitterly hated by the vested interests of San Francisco. He had to be gotten out of the way. Mooney and Billings were convicted, the former being sentenced to death, the latter receiving a lifetime term. The outrageous manner in which the trial was conducted the evident perjury of the state witnesses and the clear hand of the manufacturers backing the prosecution aroused the country. The matter ultimately was brought up before Congress. The latter passed a resolution ordering the Labor Department to investigate the case. The report of Commissioner John D. Desmore, sent to San Francisco for this purpose, exposed the conspiracy to hang Mooney as one of the methods of the Chamber of Commerce to destroy organized labor in California. Since then, most of the state witnesses, having failed to receive the reward promised them, confessed to having perjured themselves at the instigation of Charles M. Fricker, then District Attorney of San Francisco, and a known tool of the Chamber of Commerce. Draper Hand and R. W. Smith, police officials of the city, have both declared in sworn affidavits that the evidence against Mooney and Billings was manufactured from the beginning to end by the district attorney and his bribed witnesses from the lowest social dregs of the coast. The Mooney-Billings case attracted national and even international attention. President Wilson felt induced to wire the governor of California twice asking for a, rev a revision of the case. Mooney's death sentence was commuted to life imprisonment, but no effort has succeeded in securing him a new trial. The money power of California was bent on keeping Mooney and Billings in the penitentiary. The Supreme Court of the state, obedient to the Chamber of Commerce, steadfastly refused on technical grounds to review the trial testimony, the perjured character of which had become a byword in California. Since then, all the surviving jurors have made statements to the effect that if the true facts of the case had been known to them during the trial, they would have never convicted Mooney. Even Judge Frazier, who presided at the trial, has asked for Mooney's pardon on similar grounds. Yet both Tom Mooney and Warren Billings still remain in the penitentiary. The Chamber of Commerce of California is determined to keep them there. 
and their power is supreme with the courts and the government. Can you still speak of justice? Do you still think justice possible to labor under the reign of capitalism? The ju judicial murder of the Chicago anarchists took place many years ago in 1887. Considerable time has also elapsed since the Moody Billings case in 1916-17. The latter, moreover, happened far away on the Pacific coast at a time of war hysteria. Such rank injustice could only take place in those days, you might say. It could hardly be repeated today. Let us then shift the scene to our own day, to the very heart of America, the proud seat of culture, to Boston, Massachusetts. It is sufficient to, men to mention Boston to call up the picture of the two proletarians, Nico Nicola Sacco and Bartolomeo Vanzetti, one a poor shoemaker, the other a fish peddler, whose names are known and honored in every civilized country the world over. Martyrs hum to humanity, if there ever were any. The two men gave up their lives because of their devotion to mankind, because of their loyalty to an ideal of an emancipated and freed working class. Two innocent men who bravely suffered torture during seven long years and who died a terrible death with a serenity of spirit rarely equaled by the greatest martyrs of all time. The story of that judicial murder of the two of the noblest of men, the crime of Massachusetts that will neither be forgotten nor forgiven as long as the state exists, is too fresh in the memory of everyone to need reca recapitulation here. But why did Sacco and Vanzetti have to die? The question is of utmost moment. It bears directly upon the matters at issue. Do you think that if Sacco and Vanzetti had just been a pair of criminals as the prosecution tried to make you believe, there would have been such a ruthless determination to execute them in the face of appeals, pleadings, and protests of the entire world? Try. Or, if they had been plutocrats, actually guilty of murder, with no other issue involved, would they have been executed? Would no appeal to the higher courts of the state have been allowed? Would the federal Supreme Court have refused to consider the case? You have often heard of some rich fellow killing a man, or sons of wealthy parents found guilty of murder in the first degree, but can you name a single uh, one of them ever executed in the United States? Will you even discover many of them in prison? Nope. Does the law always find excuses of mental excitation, of brainstorm, oh. of legal irresponsibility? In uh, and then for a modern analog, it's, uh, you know, based on what, what race a, a mass shooter is, it, it, it determines whether or not they were a lone wolf with uh, mental problems or whether or not they were, uh, you know, that's just what, <laughs> or whether, they're, you know, a terrorist or um, a, a radical anarchist, you know, they'll put so many group labels on so 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 when you're uh a white person in this country and you do something wrong you get to be an individual we get to look at your individual motives and uh consider all the different parts that that uh, may put you in a better light if you're not well then you're part of a group you know it's uh well look at chicago that's that's the biggest dog whistle of the day all the all the murders that happen in Chicago, all the black on black crime, you know, all these 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 group figures come out that they'll be called a thug, as the, as though that's something just essential to um, people of a certain race. Uh, they'll they'll dig into their their criminal histories and 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 wildly speculate, just and just outright lie too. Uh, I remember that happening with, with Trayvon Martin, where there was this group of complete wingnuts who, who were convinced that Skittles was a, a code word for drugs. They couldn't even accept that he had gone to the store to get an actual real pack of Skittles. It had to be that he was going to score some drugs for them, because that's what those people do in their minds. But every time it's a white person who comes out, 
with these these shootings. It's a troubled past or had trouble connecting to society or, you know, all, all the, these, these sob stories. They'll come up with any excuse why they were just a complete Boy Scout who was led astray and, and had one bad day and couldn't take it anymore. And can't we all relate to that? And uh, But every time it's the reverse, it's, well, here we go, here we go again. This is why we need to, you know beef up policing and and send people to harsher uh, sentences for for any offense enact draconian laws all these sorts of things these systemic changes we need to make every time a non-white person does something um yeah the, the same is, is true between the classes as, as Berkman is bringing up you know oh Oh, good example of that was um, that guy who was caught sexually assaulting a woman behind a dumpster. Uh, his name escapes me right now. Brock Turner, that's his name. Uh, oh boy, do they they have so much sympathy for him and how a conviction's gonna ruin this this promising young life and all for just a few minutes of action is the way they framed it, which itself is really icky, but. Uh, boy, they, they just bent over backwards to find sympathy for the poor lad because he came from a wealthy family, he went to a good school, and this was going to derail his future chances of, I don't know, doing whatever the hell rich person track he was on. Probably just end up owning his father's business, you know, let's be real. <laughs> but never once did they, they consider what not convicting him would do to say potential future victims you know what not having consequences would do to uh the likelihood of him reoffending. what it would do to the reputation of the, the 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 poor woman who he had victimized never that never once was that brought up um and it's because she was not from as, as well off of a family and she was a woman of course so inherent suspect uh, motives of being passed out, I guess. Yeah, he, he, Berkman is exactly right. They, every single time they will bend over backwards and the news media will eat it up and, and join in the chorus. Uh, more often than not, if it's, if it's corporate news, guess what? They're going to they're gonna attack towards uh, defending property and its owners as well, just like the government, which is a good reason to not follow for-profit news as much as, as possible. All right, let's keep going. Oh, we're getting pretty dang close. Only a little more than 10 minutes. I don't think we're going to quite make it, but we're going to get close. But if Sacco and Vanzetti had been ordinary criminals sentenced to die... Would not appeals from prominent men in all walks of life, from charitable societies, and hundreds of thousands of friends and sympathizers have secured clemency for them? Would not doubt of their guilt, expressed by the highest legal authorities, have resulted in a new trial, a revision of the old testimony, and the consideration of new evidence on their behalf? Why was all this refused to Sacco and Vanzetti? Why did law and order, beginning with the local police and federal detectives, up to the confessedly prejudiced trial judge, all the way through the Supreme Court of the state, the governor, and ending with the federal Supreme Court, show such a determination to send them to the electric chair? Because Sacco and Vanzetti were dangerous to the interests of capital. These men voiced dissatisfaction of the workers with their condition of servitude. They expressed consciously what the, what the workers mostly feel unconsciously. It is because they were class conscious men, anarchists, that they were a greater menace to the security of capitalism than if they had been a whole army of strikers not conscious of the real objects of class struggle. The masters know that when you strike you demand only higher pay or shorter hours of work. But the class-conscious struggle of labor against capital is far more serious. It means the entire abolition of the wage system 
and the freeing of labor from the do domination of capital. You can readily understand, then, why the master saw a greater danger in such men as Sacco and Vanzetti than the biggest strike for mere improvement of condi conditions within capitalism. Sacco and Vanzetti threatened the whole structure of capitalism and government. Not those two poor proletarians as individuals, no, rather what those two men represented, a spirit of conscious rebellion against existing conditions of exploitation and oppression. It is the spirit which capital and government meant to kill in the persons of those men, to kill that spirit and movement for labor's emancipation by striking terror into the hearts of those who might think and feel like Sacco and Vanzetti, to make an example of those two men that would intimidate the workers and keep them away from the proletarian movement. This is the reason why neither the courts nor the government of Massachusetts could be induced to give Sacco and Vanzetti a new trial. There was the danger of their being acquitted in the atmosphere of aroused public sense of justice. There was the fear that the plot to murder them would be exposed. That is why the justices of the Federal Supreme Court declined to hear the case, just as the justices of the Supreme Court of the state of Massachusetts refused a new trial in spite of important new evidence. For that reason, also, the President of the United States did not intercede in the matter, though it was no less his moral than legal duty to do so. His moral duty, in the interests of justice, his legal obligation, because as President, he had sworn to uphold the Constitution, which guarantees everyone a fair trial, which Sacco and Vanzetti did not get. President Coolidge had sufficient precedence for interceding in behalf of justice, notably the example of Woodrow Wilson in the case of Mooney. But Coolidge had not the courage to do so, being entirely subservient to the big interests. No doubt the case of Sacco and Vanzetti was also considered of even greater importance and class significance than that of Mooney. At any rate, both capital and government agreed to resolve and uphold the courts of Massachusetts at all costs and to sacrifice Niccolo Sacco and Bartolomeo Vanzetti. The masters were determined to uphold the legend of justice through the courts. Because their whole power rests in the popular belief of such, such justice, it is not that infallibility is claimed for judges. If that were the attitude, there would be no appeal from the decision of a judge. There would be neither superior nor supreme courts. The fallibility of justice is admitted, but the fact that the courts and all government institutions serve only to support the rule of masters over their labor slaves, that their justice is but class justice, that could not be admitted even for an instant, because if the people found that out, capitalism and government would be doomed. That is what, exactly why no impartial review of the evidence in the Sacco and Vanzetti case could be permitted no new trial given them, for such a proceeding would have exposed the motives and objects at the back of their prosecution. Therefore, there was no appeal and no new trial, only a star chamber hearing behind closed doors in the governor's mansion by men whose loyalty to the dominant class was above suspicion. Men who by all their training and education, by their tradition and interests, were bound to sustain the courts and clear, Sacco and, Benz and clear the Sacco and Vanzetti verdict of any imputation of class justice. Therefore, Sacco and Vanzetti had to die. Governor Fuller of Massachusetts pronounced the final word of their doom. There were even, up to the last moment, thousands who hoped that the, government, that the governor would shrink from committing this cold-blooded murder. But they did not know or had forgotten that years before, in 1919, the same Fuller had stated in Congress that every radical, socialist, IWW, or anarchist should be exterminated. That is, those who seek to free labor should be murdered. Could you reasonably be, expect such a man to do justice to Sacco and Vanzetti? No. Nope. Two about anarchists? Definitely not. Governor Fuller acted according to his sentiments keeping with his attitude and interests as a member of the ruling class. 
in a matter thoroughly class conscious. Similarly, have acted Judge Thayer and all those involved in the prosecution, no less than the respectable gentlemen of the commission appointed by Fuller to review the case in a secret session. All of them class conscious, they were interested only in sustaining capitalistic justice so as to pervert, preserve law and order by which they live and profit. Is there justice for labor within capitalism and government? Can there be any as long as the present system exists? Decide for yourself. The cases I have cited are but a few of the numerous struggles of American labor against capital. The same can be duplicated in every country. They clearly demonstrate the fact that, one, there is only class justice in the war of capital against labor. There can be no justice for labor under capitalism. Very well put. Law and government, as well as all other capitalist institutions, the press, the school, the church, the police, and courts, are always at the service of capital against labor, whatever the merits of any given case. Capital and government are twins with one common interest. Three, capital and government will use any and all means necessary to keep the proletariat in subjection. They will terrorize the working class and ruthlessly murder its most intelligent and devoted members. Mm -hmm. It cannot be said otherwise, because there is a life and death struggle between capital and labor. Every time that capital and its servant the law hang such men as the Chicago anarchists, or electrocute the Sackos and Vanzettis, they proclaim that they have freed society from a menace. They want you to believe that the executed were your enemies, enemies of society. They also want you to believe that their deaths has settled the matter, that capitalistic justice has been vindicated, that law and order has triumphed, that the matter is not settled, and the master's victory is only temporary. The struggle goes on as it has continued all throughout history of man, all through the march of labor and liberty. No matter is ever settled unless it is settled right. You can't suppress the natural yearning of the human heart for freedom and well-being, however much terror and murder government result may resort to. You can't stifle the demand of the toiler for better conditions. The struggle goes on and will continue in spite of everything law, government, and capital may do. But so that the workers may not be wasting their energy and efforts in the wrong direction, they must clearly understand that they can no more hope for justice from the courts, from law and government, than they can expect wage slavery to be abolished by their masters. What's to be done then, you ask? How shall the workers get justice? All right, we made it, <laughs> just by the skin of our teeth. You can find more Audible Anarchists on YouTube. And sorry, I didn't have more commentary on, on that last section there. Uh, it's just that I was trying to finish it up, and I have a very uh, definite stop time of 9 o'clock, which we just now passed. But um, definitely need to get up early in the morning, and my wife has been sick, so she needs to get rest too. So that's why I kind of allowed things to play out. But we'll just get that out of the way for now. Uh, if you are interested in this stuff, you can go ahead and give me a follow on my link tree. Whoops, that's not what I meant to do. I put it in the wrong place. Let's try the chat. How about that? <laughs> so there you go. There's my link tree coming up. I got I to gotta fix that Nightbot and get rid of that one. I think I'm going to be done with Nightbot for now. Stream Elements seems to do things just as well, if not better. And I also have RestreamBot, although it didn't come into play tonight. Uh, it's kind of cool that now, no matter where you are watching the stream from, if you make a comment, it will re-comment uh, on all the other the platforms. So if you make a comment in Facebook, it'll, it'll make it on Twitch and YouTube and uh, Twitter all at the same time. And same is true of all of them. So that's kind of cool. Uh, keeps the, the, the conversation a little more centralized, so you don't have to 
you know, feel like you're only interacting with the same people on, on the platform that you're watching on, which is also the point of, of putting the chat up on, on the stream, on the screen here too. Um, yeah, that's going to do it for tonight. Uh, if I had one criticism so far of, of this book, I keep hearing these comments. This is, this is like the, the, you know, this was my best introduction to anarchism. This is what really got me in anarchism, all this stuff like that. And I can definitely see he's a, he's a great writer and he, he has a wonderful critique of, of capitalism, but it seems to me that that is the, the bulk, like the, basically the main thrust of, of most of his arguments is, is more an anti-capitalist argument rather than being a, a pro-anarchist argument. And I kind of wish, I, I, I'm, kind of, I'm still kind of looking for more of that, that flavor to be added into the mix. You know, so so it's great to to lay out why the justice system is pro capitalist and and uh, set up that way intentionally uh, to to favor owners and their property. But it would be even better if if we were to do at least uh, you know somewhat of a thought experiment about how a justice system under anarchy would would look and sh and be shaped. Oh. What's up, Twitch? Hey, can you not? I'm almost done. Thank you. So anyway, we're going to go ahead and raid out right now into, hey, seriously. We're going to go into MitNerd, a really great streamer. So there, if you're not following on Twitch, uh, that is the, the link to go to. And we'll go ahead and start the raid right now. So thank you all for joining me. Hope to, to see you again on Sunday. Be streaming again once more. Haven't decided yet exactly what the topic will be, but I'll, I will announce that soon. If you're lucky. Twitch universe loves me. Yeah. So here we go and start the raid.